First Corinthians, not First Corinthians, First Timothy. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 3. And those of you who are visiting, you're thinking, man, these people cheer about everything. Hey, hey, wouldn't you rather have a group that cheers at everything instead of heckling at everything? Come on now. So um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. But First Timothy chapter 1, chapter 1, and we're looking at verses 12 through 17. If for a chance you don't have a Bible with you, that's all right. We have the text. It'll appear on the slide behind me, and you can follow along. So beginning at verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask, God, that it would penetrate our hearts and that by your spirit you would do the work that you desire in us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You're going to get dizzy. You know, my... Grandson Luke just turned two, and I think this is a great age. This is when he wants to play a lot, he wants to run, he's trying to form words, and then he's putting those words together into what he thinks is intelligible speech, okay? So he's doing all of those things, and I just think this is a fun time. Anyway, Sandy and I were with Luke the other night, and the other thing we're seeing is that he's discovering Things. He's discovering things that, of course, we know and we take for granted. But it's just great to watch a child that age discover these things because then everything becomes new for us. So anyway, we were with him the other night, and Luke has discovered how to make himself dizzy. <laughs> He's discovered how to do that. So we were watching him, and, and he would start spinning. And we didn't know that he was doing this, but he would start spinning three, four, five times. And, and the entire time, I'm warning him, but he doesn't know what I'm saying. I'm warning him, you're going to get dizzy. But he's spinning two, three, four times, and then we could watch him, and you could tell from the expression on his face that he was feeling disoriented. But he was smiling. He was loving it. He was feeling disoriented, but fully enjoying it. Then he'd fall. Then he'd get back up and go at it again. I'll come back to that in a moment. Friends, we're living at a time when it's easy to feel dizzy and get disoriented. But unlike Luke's experience, it's not fun. Consider the occurrences from just the last two weeks. The mass killing in Orlando, an act of terror. The sit-in at the house by those who are wanting more gun control. Great Britain has left the European Union. Does that mean anything to anybody here? I know when I saw that, I'm thinking, oh, wow. Look at how some of that biblical end-time prophecy is beginning to shape up. Remember when we went through those messages in Daniel and we talked about the image in Daniel's dream and going piece by piece by piece, and when you get down to the Roman Empire, that's the one empire that wasn't conquered. It imploded. And then the Bible speaks about those ten toes and a horn coming out of those ten toes, ten kingdoms, and biblical prophecy teachers, or I should say end-time prophecy teachers, for decades have indicated that that conglomeration, those kingdoms, that that points to this European Union. And we spoke about that that particular Sunday night. But the Bible speaks about 10 kingdoms. But there are 28 nations. And, and I mentioned, if you remember on that Sunday night, listen, if God can dismantle, if he was able to dismantle the USSR overnight, 
He can surely make a change when it comes to the economic union. Now we're hearing about Great Britain pulling out and that other nations might be looking to pull out. They're feeling empowered. Friends, so these are some of the things that we're hearing and that we're living through. And then on the heels of that, that happened Thursday night. Then Friday morning, I saw this report that President Obama declared that Stonewall Inn is a national monument. You might be thinking, well, what is that? Well, that's a New York City tavern where in 1969, a police raid impacted several gay patrons, and that ignited the gay rights movement. And now that tavern has been declared by our president as the first national monument to gay rights. Really? That's what's needed? That's what's needed by people who are caught in a web of deception and confusion? because they have stepped away from God's created order? What's needed is a national monument? I don't agree with our president. I believe what's needed is a clear clarion call to the cross, that place where we all must go for salvation from sin and from ourselves, the place where we begin to think correctly, because we begin to think in alignment with God's word. So all of that in just a few weeks. So as I said, it's easy to get dizzy. Now going back to my grandson, he'd spin and he'd fall. Then he would sit up. He'd look around until he could find where Sandy was and where I was. He'd take a quick look at the room. Then he would stand up again, spin three, four, five times, fall down. Get up. Take a look. Okay, she's there. He's there, same room, away we go. What was he doing? He was getting his bearings. Friends, from time to time, we need to get our bearings. We've got to figure out our position relative to our surroundings. It's important to consider where we've come from and where we are presently in order to know where we are to go. You see, we've got to make sure that we're moving in the right direction, keeping this in mind, that the right direction is always his direction. We've got to get our bearings. That's the reason for this present series, Church Life, a pastor's memoir. Let me explain the title, Church Life. When we become followers of Jesus, the church becomes a large component of our lives, and rightly so. So we've got to learn. We've got to learn the best way to function in this organism, the church. A pastor's memoir. You know, a memoir is a record of events written by a person having intimate knowledge of those events, a person who's made personal observations. And when it comes to expressing how we, the church, are to function in and outside of the building, one man stands out from the crowd, and that's the Apostle Paul. The letters to the churches that he planted and pastors as well as the letters that he wrote to church leaders are filled with Christian doctrine and also the correct expected practices of the church. Now we know that Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What he wrote is God's Word, and the Holy Spirit has preserved that for us. That said, Paul did not write in a vacuum. None of the writers of the Scriptures wrote in a vacuum. They wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They wrote as the Holy Spirit directed them, as he dictated to them. But they wrote through their personalities. God used their observations. He used who they were as they wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. So what we have in those epistles is really from time to time, pages from memoirs of a pastor, memoirs of Paul. So I've chosen to approach these particular scriptures these next few weeks with that in mind because it adds. I think it adds to the intimacy of our exploration. In this context, we'll consider the following over the next few weeks. Sit at my table, speaking about our spiritual legacy, plays well with others, We'll talk about relationships. 
relationships, not so much out there, in here. Pastor, you really think we need to be schooled about re- oh, yeah, we need to be schooled about relationships in here because we have certain expectations of each other in here that we don't have of those that we're in relationship with out there. So we're going to talk about that, and then let's go fishing, which will segue into my second summer series, rescue. Rescue. That word is going to set the pace for the rest of 2016. But you see, friends, before we can jump into the storm to rescue those who are spiritually drowning, we have to make sure that we have our bearings. Because if we don't, if we go into the storm to save those who are drowning in the storm and we don't have our bearings, then we're going to get lost or sidetracked in the storm. And what good will we do? So for the next few weeks, we're going to just make sure, get our bearings, make sure that we're in alignment with what God is Spirit, that God's Spirit is saying to us as a local body of believers. So we'll start today with the first installation installment, the family name. We've got to be sure that we know who we are and that indeed we're part of the family. I'm not talking about the AHCC family. I'm talking about the family of God. We've got to make sure that we are members of the family of God. We've got to make sure that we're carrying correctly the family name, Christian. You know, friends, we're living at a time when the name Christian has come to mean someone who believes things about Jesus rather than a disciple who believes in Jesus and follows him. Did you hear me? There are those who define Christian like this, someone who believes things about Jesus rather than a disciple who believes in and follows Jesus. And I can't think of a greater tragedy than for someone to think they're a believer and find out that they're not. Pastor, do you think that's going to happen? We know it's going to happen because Jesus said it's going to happen. He said that on that day when we have to come before him that there'll be those who'll say, don't you remember me? I did this in your name and I did that in your name and I did this other thing in your name. And Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. This is not my paraphrase. This is Jesus speaking. We'll say to those individuals, I never knew you. Depart from me. Friends, that should, that should shoot chills up our back. Because I can't think of a greater tragedy than that. So we got to know, we got to make sure that we indeed are members of the family of God. So let's start by getting a number of misconceptions out of the way. You're not a Christian. You're not a Christian just because you were raised by Christian parents. Now let me tell you, let me tell you, if you're born in a Christian home, you have a great advantage. You have a great advantage because now you have parents who love Jesus. You have parents who are fully submitted to the Lord. You have parents who are going to use God's word the best they know how to direct what happens in that place. You're going to have parents who are listening to the voice of the Lord as they groom you, as they teach you, as they raise you. We are far closer. We are far closer to coming to Jesus by living in a Christian home than if we weren't living in a Christian home. That's a tremendous blessing. If you have Christian parents, you need to wake up every morning and thank God that you have Christian parents. Because they value more than the material. They value your spiritual life. But having said that, just because you were blessed or are blessed by living in a Christian home, that alone does not make you a Christian. You're not a Christian just because you come to church. I'm glad you're here. Don't get me wrong. This is a wonderful place to come. And you'll meet some pretty amazing people who have phenomenal stories of what God has done in their lives. And chances are when you come, you're going to feel good. I hope you do. I would much rather have people leaving here and saying, but I felt so good after that time. I don't want people leaving here and saying that was the lousiest time I've ever had in my life. So yeah, those things will happen. But please understand that coming to church alone 
coming to church and sitting in this building makes you no more a Christian than sleeping in a garage makes you a car. Doesn't happen. You're not a Christian just because you enjoy worship music. I don't really care how many worship concerts you go to and how many downloads you get from every worship outlet that there is out there. Oh, it'll have an impact on you. How can it not? God's word always has an impact. You'll probably even sense God's presence. How can it not? When worship music that's written under the anointing of the Holy Spirit is being written in order to invoke, in order to invite the presence of God, you might even feel that. You might even feel good. You're gonna, listen, listen, if you're not walking with Jesus, I, it's far better that you listen to worship music than what's being produced by the world. Absolutely. But let's get it right. Worship music alone does not make us a Christian. Worship music doesn't even change us. You know how I know that? There's a certain king, first king of Israel, King Saul. And the Bible says an evil spirit got into that man. Do you know what would soothe him? Do you know what would bring him relief? When David, when David was called into his presence and Saul would say, play your instrument, play your instrument. And let me tell you, come on, with what we know about David, you know David was not playing top 40. He was playing worship music. Some of those psalms that he was inspired to write, he was inspired when he was out there taking care of his father's sheep. He was a worshiper. So Saul would bring him in. He would play that music. He would get relief. The Bible tells us he would be soothed. He would get relief. Was he changed? No. How do I know that? Because when the concert was over, that man was picking up a javelin and literally trying to nail David to the wall. Because David had been chosen as the next king of Israel. He still had a jealous, murderous heart. Worship music alone didn't do it. They brought relief. But they didn't bring change. You're not a Christian just because you do good things and fight for justice. Those are great things. It's commendable if you do that. But that does not make you a Christian. It makes you a good world citizen, but it does not guarantee that you're a citizen of the kingdom of God. Well, then what does make you and me a Christian? What's necessary? Well, let's consider Paul's testimony. Let me read it to you again. Beginning at verse 12, chapter 1. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor, a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus, might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. How do we know we're a Christian? Well, first of all, we need to understand the workings of our salvation. Friends, it's a God thing. Salvation is a God thing. Did you notice how much of God's initiative is mentioned in Paul's testimony? First of all, there's that powerful statement in the middle of his report. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Long before any of us even had a thought about coming to Jesus, Jesus came to us. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Friends, when it comes to our salvation, it is a God thing. He came up with the idea. The Bible says that it was his plan before the foundation of the world to send Jesus to save us from our sin. Paul goes on to tell us then that God 
It was God who poured out his grace along with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Then it was Christ who displayed his unlimited patience. And then it was Christ who gave him strength. Friends, when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to becoming a part of his family, God takes the first step. He is the one that initiates salvation. He always has and he always will. It's God the Holy Spirit. It's God the Holy Spirit who pursues us, who convicts us. That means he convinces us of our sin. And then he points us to the only one who can save us, Jesus. It is God who is initiating this work, who is calling people to salvation. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves this world. Friends, listen, when we read in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, please understand that God is still loving the world. It's not like he loved the world when he sent his son, and now he looks at the world and he no longer loves the world. He loves people. And he is not willing that any should perish. So when it comes to salvation, it's a God thing. So that's really why we really can't do anything. That's why it doesn't matter whether I live in a Christian home or I have Christian parents or I come to church. It doesn't matter whether or not I listen to worship music. No, what matters is that it's God who is initiating this thing because I can't do it. I cannot save myself. You cannot save yourself. It's a God thing. He initiates it. Do you ever wonder? Do you ever wonder why God puts up with all that's happening? Have you ever wondered why the second coming of Jesus Christ hasn't already taken place? Well, the Bible tells us the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. It's a God thing. Secondly, it's all about God's grace. Paul makes it clear that he was the worst of sinners, that he wasn't deserving of anything, but that God's grace was poured out on him abundantly. Friends, again, we are all incapable of attaining or gaining our salvation by our own effort. We cannot save ourselves. There is nothing that we can do except to receive his grace. Here's how the Bible puts it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Friends, in the face of our disobedience, our total disregard of God and his word, God intervenes by pouring out his grace abundantly. God's grace has the power. God's grace has the power to bring us from death, spiritual death, to spiritual life. God's grace has the power to bring us from failure, from guilt, from shame, from sin, to forgiveness and completeness and wholeness and into a relationship with the living God. God's grace can do that. God's grace reaches down into the quagmire of our lives and somehow gets up underneath us. And when we respond to the love of God, it buoys us, it lifts us into God's presence. It's all about grace. I can't do a thing. You can't do a thing to earn salvation. To go on that, to go on that journey is just to be on a journey of frustration. It can't be done. It's a grace thing. Now, we are saved to do works because God's grace does all those things, and then we function with his, within his grace and then under his authority to do those things that he created us to do that will advance his kingdom. And it's there that we find true fulfillment. We are truly fulfilled when we are doing the things that God has created us to do. We are truly fulfilled when we are who God has created us to be. 
you know a crisis, a crisis that I have never gone through? And I know I haven't gone through this crisis because I gave my life to Jesus at an early age. And I imagine for those of you who have experienced the same thing, you have never gone through this crisis. I have never gone through the crisis of asking who am I and why am I on this planet? I have never asked my, can you imagine that? I was born and raised in the Cooper Park Projects in the inner city of New York. If anybody should be asking the question, who am I and what is my purpose in my life, it should be me. But I have never in my life had to ask that question. I've never had that identity crisis. Who am I and why am I here? Because Jesus, who initiates salvation, moved in grace, I responded to that as many of you have from an early age. And so we knew, we knew, and we know who we are. We know why we're here, and we know where we're going. Because there's no greater fulfillment. There is no greater fulfillment than fulfilling what God has purposed for you to do. No greater fulfillment. And that's all a part of grace. And we read that. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared for us to do. So we don't do works to be saved. There's nothing we can do to earn our salvation. But once we are saved, we're going to do good works. But those works are going to be directed by the Lord, and everything that he directs is going to have an eternal purpose. It's going to last. So we're fulfilled. So we can't work for our salvation. It's a matter of grace. It's a matter of God's grace. But how do we receive grace? Well, it's time to repent. Back to Paul's testimony. Even though I once was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, even though I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. Paul tells us that's what he was. And most of us know the story from the book of Acts. You know, Paul was a rabbi of rabbis. When he heard about the spread of Christianity, he saw that as a sect that would disrupt the status quo. Having said that, really as Christians, we should be upsetting the status quo. But they were, and that's how he saw them. They were upsetting the status quo. They had to be stopped. So he made that his personal mission. So he became a persecutor of Christians. And on this particular occasion, he goes to the high priest. He wants letters, warrants, so that he could arrest Christians and imprison them. Well, on the way to Damascus, the Bible indicates that a light shone from heaven. When Paul saw that light, later on we find out it blinded him. He falls to the ground, and he asked the question. See, Paul is smart enough to know something supernatural is happening. So he asked the question, Lord, who are you? Because before that, he hears a voice asking him a question, why are you persecuting me? Then he asks, Lord, who are you? And then he makes it clear that it's Jesus. Because Jesus identifies with the suffering. So he identified with those who were being persecuted. And then he goes on to tell Paul, now what you need to do is go to the city and wait there, my paraphrase, until my next word to you. Well, he can't see. He has his friends take him into the city. He waits there. The Lord speaks to Ananias. Ananias goes to meet with Paul. At that time, his name was Saul. He has this experience with the Lord, the Spirit of God. He becomes Paul. Now this man who was trying to snuff out Christianity becomes a defender of Christianity and the greatest preacher of grace. Friends, that speaks about repentance. He was going in one direction, but when he had an encounter with Jesus, he began to move in another direction. The way that we receive God's grace is that we repent. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. He convinces us of our sin. He doesn't condemn us because condemnation keeps us from the cross. Conviction should drive us to the cross. He convinces us of our need. He reveals Jesus to us, and then we have a decision to make. Repentance is a deliberate act of the will, a deliberate act of the will to turn around. When we repent and we respond to God's grace by recanting or rejecting our former ways and assuming an attitude of humility before Jesus, then we become recipients of his grace. But we repent. So friends, it's not enough. 
It's not enough to be raised in a Christian home or to come to church services or listen to worship music or do good things and fight for justice. All of that might make us feel good and even offer us a measure of relief, but none of that, none of that will take care of the sin issue in our lives. None of that is going to cause us to be made into a new creation. None of that is going to give us a new nature or a new heart. None of that is going to put us on a journey to have our minds renewed in keeping with God's word. Only God's grace will do that. And we become recipients of his grace when we repent. We repent. I'm done with this. I'm done with living life on my terms. I'm done with disregarding my creator. I'm a sinner. Okay? We repent, and then we accept. I receive God's gift of salvation, and we accept Jesus' lordship. We accept Jesus Christ into our lives. Listen, there's that teaching that's being, we've talked about, that's being propagated out there. You know, Jesus did it all. He took care of it. So the plan of salvation has been met. The provision is there. Sins are forgiven. The devil's been defeated. Everybody, everybody is a Christian. So it's a deception. And the problem with false teaching is that there's always a kernel of truth. If not, we wouldn't be deceived. And when it comes to that particular teaching, there's a few kernels of truth. Jesus did come to save the world. Jesus did die on the cross. He did become sin for mankind. He did carry all the sins, past, present, and future. He became sin. He is the redeemer. He did break the enemy's back. All of that happened at the cross. And now the gift of salvation is available. But I've got to do something. I can't earn it. I've got to receive it. I've got to receive his grace. I've got to repent. I have to accept him. I, and, and to accept him means he's going to come into my life as my savior and my king. I have to accept him. You know, and I've told you before, it's no different than receiving a gift. You've got to do something. You know, not too long ago, somebody, somebody put a gift in my hands. And at first, I said, no, no, you don't have to do that because they were giving this to me because of something I had done. I said, please, no, you don't need to do that. No, 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 we want to. No, I don't, no, you don't have to. No, I want to. So I took it. Then once I got home, I opened the card. Inside the card, there's a little gift card. And I was like, oh, that's great. But then I opened the box. And inside the box, get this, a bag of M&Ms and a box of Cheerios. <laughs> and you know that Cheerios, if you, Cheerios make M&Ms healthy. And get this, not that I am, but the box said that this particular box of Cheerios was gluten-free. So, I mean, it was like real healthy. <laughs> so now I received that. See, the next thing is I have to pick the right time, the right night, and I get one of those little snack-sized baggies. I put a little bit of Cheerios in there, a few M&Ms, just a few, and it's like a surprise. I never quite know which handful. It's just wonderful. It's just a wonderful experience. <laughs> but I had to receive the gift. It only became a gift because I received it. It only became a gift because I accepted it. It only became a gift because once I got home, I opened it. So this idea that everybody, everybody is redeemed and on their way to heaven because of what Jesus did on the cross. That's a deception. And unfortunately, there are people who are going to have a very rude awakening when it's too late because we have to accept the gift. He took care of it, but I have to accept Jesus all the benefits of salvation are freely provided by God, but we must receive the gift. And when we accept Christ, when we submit, when we surrender, when we open our lives to him, then we receive God's saving grace. Our nature is changed. 
Our heart does become tender toward him. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. And the resources of heaven, God's power, are made available to us. The Bible tells us this. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. We have an amazing Savior who on the cross purchase us an amazing salvation. Available to all of us. But we've got to make sure. We just got to make sure that indeed we have accepted his gift. We just got to make sure, friends. We just got to make sure that we came and we've come to that place where we've said, God, I agree with you. I agree with you. I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I confess. I repent. I am done with this, living life on my own terms. I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and I accept him as my Savior, my Lord. Forgive me. And he does. He forgives us, and he makes us brand new creations. And everybody here who's walking with Jesus, just say a hearty, sober amen. Amen. Pastor Shannon, please come back. You know, I told people, I told the people this Wednesday night during our prayer, prayer time, before we went to prayers, I was going through the word with them. I told them that if the Lord, if the Lord never did another thing for us. If he never did another thing for us outside of our salvation, that we would have enough to keep us praising, to keep us praising him throughout eternity. Because of his grace, not a thing, not a thing, not a blessing, nothing, nothing. If he did absolutely nothing by way of another gift to put in our hands, friends, by virtue of the fact, listen, that he saved us, that would keep us singing praises to him throughout eternity. Now, we know because he's a giving God, he's constantly pouring out blessing. He's always working on our behalf. He's always doing. But again, we would have enough reason to praise him throughout eternity based on our salvation. I want to make sure, friends, we got to make sure that everybody in this house, that everybody associated with Auburn Hills Christian Center has that assurance. I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. And I know I do. Because he saved me. Because I repented of my sin. I received his grace. I accepted him. I don't know if I need to say this, but I'll say it anyway. You know, there might be some who would think, you know, Pastor, why, why would you have to preach a message like this? Well, because as your pastor... I, I, I couldn't even imagine, Pastor Shannon, as pastors of this church, to allow someone to think they're a believer and then find out that they're not when they stand before the Lord. That's just not a, for lack of a better word, that is not a chance I want to take. So I bring that before us. I got to know, I got to know for sure that indeed Jesus is my Savior. You know, I'm reminded, you know, you hear so many and you read so many articles about things that happened when the Titanic sunk. And one little story that stood out to us, and only a short little thing, but after that boat sank and there were survivors still in the water. The story goes that there was a gentleman 
I don't know if it was from Scotland or Scotland, and he had that Scottish brogue because others heard him and they reported this. So he's out in the water surviving himself, but hearing the splashing of other survivors. And, and while he's out there, he's calling out to those who he could hear splashing around, Are you saved, man? Are you saved, man? That was his concern. Are you saved? Are you saved? <laughs> Regardless if a lifeboat comes and gets us, hey, are you saved? Dear ones, I would be derelict of my duties if I didn't ask the question this morning, are you saved? Are you saved? And please understand, I don't preach this message to bring doubt into anybody's mind. I bring this message so that every one of us leaves here with assurance, yes, yes. Yes, I'm a child of God. I know it. I know it. It's based on God's word. It's based on God's word. And that's where I stand and that's where I live. So let's stand before the Lord. Let's pray. And then we'll open these altars. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And I thank you, God, for so great, so great a salvation. I thank you for Jesus, our Savior. We sang before that you're a good, good father, and yes, you are, because you're relentless in your pursuit of us. And Father, I thank you. I thank you, God, for everyone in this room, and you know everything about us. You know where we are. You know our journey. And God, what I'm asking, I am asking that everybody, that everybody who's here would leave, Lord, with that assurance. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Not based on my feeling, not based on my works, but based on my standing on God's word and trusting in his character.